Welcome back to the Nutri Medical Report and one of my favorite guests uh, talking about uh, academic Christian issues dealing with ancient, uh, if you want to call it the gospel and the stars, all the way to the remarkable book we were doing last year called The Forbidden Secret. And uh, we're coming up to uh, Passover, which is going to be Passover week is also the week we're going to have the sale from the 11th to the 14th. But it's a time when uh, Jesus died on the cross at 3 p.m. time, uh, local time in Israel on Mount Golgotha. And three days later, uh, it was resurrected. And uh, it's important for us to understand the historical factor that there's more proof that Jesus existed, died and rose from the dead than you and I exist today to even have a breath or a pulse on an EKG machine. That's how serious this is. And the fact is the world is in such a screwed up state. Without the intervention of God himself, mankind is doomed. We are literally, even if we don't have a nuclear war, we are a whimper or two, one or two decades away from the human race even being able to not reproduce uh, from all the toxic pollution and the craziness that we're doing to our planet. So, uh, Jonathan, let's start out with the Forbidden Secret again. We'll continue that dialogue. If they want to get all your ebooks, the website is beforeus.com. B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S dot com, and I highly recommend them. These are amazing reading. The great thing is you can read them on your your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, uh, and uh, they are remarkably uh, prescient in terms of actually showing academic proof for lots of things that a lot of people don't understand. They also allow us to sweep away what are called the remnants of paganism inside the Christian church, and set doctrines straight as to what they really are, were the doctrines that are taught originally in the first three centuries of the church called the Way, before it was taken over by Constantine and Domitian, and turned into, quote, Christians, which means little anointed ones. Uh, a lot of um, misinterpretations of the Bible have entered into the Bible when they absorbed through the Roman uh, church a lot of paganism that was, you know, thousands of years previous. And uh, people need to understand that the gospel is actually pretty straightforward. You know, God had to come down here, uh, incarnate as a man, show us the way back to the Father, to back to be a relationship with God, and how to bring our world into true peace. And now we're in the point where our technology is about to consume us, uh, and all of the judgments on our planet, particularly here in America, which I call Ephra America, is hanging in the balance. So America, with our current president, who is a... Um, an abomination. I guess it's got a good appropriate name, the Obomination. And the other term I use for him, and whenever you hear news on him, is oh, bummer. He's got something else he's doing to us. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Jonathan, let's let's go on to uh, talk about the uh, res the resurrection and all the the amazing proof logically and scientifically what you've done. And you have an amazing mind to be able to do this with scriptures, logic, and evidence that's often in there, including in non-Christian sources, like ancient his, uh, Roman historians, um, that people should be become aware of to realize that uh, without God intervening in our world, uh, mankind is not going to be here much longer. Uh, so, ab so absolutely right. We're living in tremendous times, and I'm very happy, Dr. Bill, that we are alive to witness some of these things, and we can uh, be part of the great warning process. Right. So let's start. Uh, uh, you know, uh, now, I'll just pop yes. in and, uh, and, and do a rah-rah or ask a question, but otherwise, uh, give us your presentation. Okay, I mean, just bring in your questions anytime you feel like it. Um, yeah, absolutely, it yeah. Be, so let's start off with yeah. uh, about the resurrection. How, how do you present it in the Forbidden Secret, which is the resurrection? It's the, the, the Forbidden Secret is that, that the, quote, the true Christian faith is the only correct faith, that all the other pathways to so-called spirituality and religion I call real lies going on, religions. Uh, there's only one truth, one way, not hundreds or thousands. Yes, that's right. Well, you know, the, the, there was no uh, dispute at all, and neither was there at the time the event happened, that the tomb of Jesus was empty on the third day. Now, how did it get empty? The, uh, the soldiers went rushing up to Jerusalem uh, and uh, they said, he's, he's risen, he's risen. And they were pulled into the Jewish council quickly before too many people could hear what they were saying. And they were bribed to tell the story that uh, while they had been asleep, the disciples had come and rolled away the stone, that great enormous stone weighing uh, 60 tons, and that the, the soldiers had not even seen them come. How do they know it was the disciples? Well, because they were bribed to say so. 
And um, the question, of course, would naturally arise, if the soldiers were asleep, surely they wouldn't all go to sleep at the same time. And if, if uh, the stone was being rolled, they would have quickly woken up uh, with the noise and stopped the event happening. So it made no sense that uh, the disciples had stolen the body. Neither would the Jewish leaders have stolen the body because uh, all they needed to refute the resurrection story was to produce the body of Jesus. And if they had stolen it, they could easily and would easily have done that. Look at all the trouble they went to get Adolf Eichmann out of South America, uh, a man who could hardly ever be expected to be found and put him on trial. They would have produced the dead body of Jesus if they had had it. So neither the disciples would have done it in fact, the disciples were too afraid. They just scattered and fled. Uh, the Jewish leaders didn't do it. Did the Roman soldiers move the body? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we know from Roman law that uh, soldiers who moved a dead body that had its a seal placed upon it or that there, where, where there was a prohibition about moving it, such as there was when the Roman seal was placed across the tomb of Jesus, they would have forfeited their lives had they, first of all, been asleep while somebody else stole it, or secondly, if they'd moved it themselves. So there was no reason, no motive for these soldiers to move the body. Right. So Jesus' disciples couldn't move it, the Jewish leaders didn't move it, the Roman soldiers didn't move it, and yet here we have it on the third day, the, the tomb is open, the body has disappeared, what became of it? That was the big question. Yeah, exactly. Now that uh, these logical questions actually put you in a position of the fact is to move these stones too was not easy. It required multiple men. It was a giant stone rolled over the opening of the cave, which is basically a tomb hollowed out for Joseph of Arimathea. It was very, we call high-end uh, crypt, if you want to call it. Uh, the, the fact is when they returned there, the burial clothes were gone, were there, and his body was gone. And yes. they had the first-hand witnesses, too, of two women. And you'd say, well, if they're trying to do a scam, first off, they wouldn't have believed the, the words of, of women in that culture then first. But God was trying to prove a point. He was trying to prove all of us are equal in God's kingdom. He was also trying to prove a point that he had, had brought these, these women. One of them was a prostitute, and one day, another lady was a, a disciple, uh, that they were actually very close to Jesus and they had received a full recompense or... If we, or we want to call it uh, salvation. They received full salvation while he was here on earth. And uh, he witnessed to them first to show that he is still living. And that's real important because if you don't have a living God, you don't really have salvation. You don't really have a pathway to peace because peace requires a transcendence of death. And that's what the whole gospel is about. It's the transcendence of death because our world is dying. We're constantly dying in a dying state. We try to make people healthier with nutraceuticals to extend their life or their wellness condition so they live longer. Maybe they go out like a light bulb at 110. But the, the fact is that we're all dying every day. And uh, what Jesus said, I'm going to bring you life. But not just a temporal life, but an eternal life. And that's what's important. You can't have a peaceful civilization. You can't have an extended lifespan, which Jesus read in the first um, Gospels of Isaiah. That he read in the first synagogue when he started his ministry that though a child, a man dies at 100, it shall be considered like the world where the years of a child. In other words, he said, I'm going to restore when the kingdom returns to earth, uh, the years of the patriarchs, which is people living near a thousand years or longer. Uh, that's one of his promises is that man will, when he, well, when man dies, he won't die the typical death. He'll go from life into life, just like Enoch was taken alive into the kingdom. That's what God's promising. A peaceful world where people don't go through the horrors of death and disease like they do now. And uh, when we return, we're going to hear more about the amazing documentation of the Forbidden Secret with Jonathan Gray. And the website is beforeus.com. Back in just a moment. And we're back with Jonathan Gray. Jonathan, uh, people need to know that God's real. Uh, we're, we're in the fire. I tell people, I said, there's three realms. We are in the lake of fire right now. We are literally in the testing realm. It was out the little magnetosphere bubble around Earth from cosmic rays, zeta particles, and gamma rays, and gamma bursts. Uh, we, we couldn't exist more than a few minutes. Uh, without God shielding us from the evils of the current world, Satan and his minions would have consumed mankind eons ago. Uh, even the flood that was a destructive thing, they talk about this movie, which is a blasphemous horror, this movie Noah, 
that was put up by Aronofsky, a Sabbatean Satanistic Jew who doesn't grasp it. And By the way, he's not a Hebrew. These are basically Khazarian Satanists that try to presume that they're Jews, and the word Jew means praiser, so he really needs repentance. It doesn't matter what his genetics are. Some of the most evil people that I've dealt with turn out to be some of the best. Uh, I'm, and I won't mention the name, but I uh, ministered to a 93-degree level Mason uh, once back about, must be about uh, 15 years ago. And I literally spent most of the day with him, and by the time I finished, he was really saved. I don't mean a little saved, he was really saved. Because he had seen the face of the, of the Dark One. He had seen the, the I call the dark majesty of evil. He didn't have any kind of misgivings about the fact of what he was up against. He had a personal experience that couldn't be equivocated. So uh, <laughs> I want people to grasp mm. this, that we're facing now the dangers of World War III coming, economic collapse, environmental collapse, uh, and uh, you know the return, as it says in the Bible, woe to you, earth, and you see, for the devil has come down to you. Uh, we're dealing with the most intelligent, malevolent evil that was ever created in the universe that was originally good and because of its own narcissism became damnably evil, Satan and his fallen ones. And they're here to literally abort mankind. And the resurrection is a sign that God's here with us today uh, through all these troubles to make our world safe again, to make people safe again, to make people understand that they're not just highly evolved slime like the stupid uh, miniseries now called Cosmos trying to, with Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, trying to convince people that they just randomly evolved up through the ladder of life from slime and pits, you know, a billion and a half years ago to all of a sudden they were now building super cities and trying to explore the stars. It's just a pile of hogwash and it doesn't even mathematically calculate out. So uh, let's go through some of the signs that we need to look for. Yes. Okay. Well, now, 50 days after the tomb of Jesus was burst open, we have the man who was a coward trying to hide for his life, Peter, suddenly right. standing up before a huge crowd and addressing them. Now, right. thousands of visitors were in Jerusalem for the Pentecost festivities. Right. And in his speech, Peter explained why the ancient prophecies had said that the coming Messiah's body, when he died, would not suffer decay. Right. Now, Peter, Peter's logic convinced 3,000 Jews in that audience that the only solution to the empty tomb was that Yeshua was bodily raised from the dead. And Peter said, look, we're all witnesses. Now, it's very significant that Peter's first speech was in the very same city where the event was alleged to have happened, the resurrection. Right. Now, just think of this. If it was all a hoax, however could he have hoped to gain believers among those who were in a position to know locally what had happened. Only weeks after the death of Jesus, their testimony right there in Jerusalem was received as true by multitudes of people because the evidence was right under their noses. Yeah. Now, wow. this local reaction, I think, Bill, is a very important indicator. Uh, with men, with women and children factored in, maybe as many as 15,000 residents of Jerusalem, about 15% of the population at that time, became believers within just days of the events. Now such a change in religious orientation was unheard of in history, especially when you realize that this was a monotheistic culture which would have difficulty in accepting the concept of Jesus also being God as well as man. Right. Now, um, um, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's important for people to understand that uh, Jesus was the full incarnation of the Father in the flesh. That's what his name means. Yahashua HaMashiach, which means the breath that creates all that ever was or will be, has incarnated and come among us. And that's why when the angel told Mary that her son would be Emmanuel, it means the creator God was going to incruel and, and as be the, literally the soul of her child would be Jesus. And it, yes. Yeah. Now, these witnesses in Jerusalem were not resting their faith on an empty tomb, but on appearances of Yeshua after the event on many different occasions. Now, um, let's, let's have a quick list of these. These were eyewitnesses. Because the Jewish, firstly the soldiers, because the Jewish authorities made special effort to prevent any resurrection by placing armed guards around the tomb, and then placing a Roman seal over the mighty stone, this very act 
would make possible a more positive and conclusive proof of what had happened. And the greater the, the number of soldiers around the tomb, the stronger would be the testimony that the dead man had risen. So a right. whole guard of soldiers became eyewitnesses. And uh, then there's the Jewish religious leaders. The fact that they bribed the soldiers to hush up the facts. And they bribed the Roman governor not to punish the soldiers for their story. These two actions demonstrated that what they were trying to hide was really an admission of the fact. So the efforts to prevent the resurrection and to circulate a false report served only to provide additional confirmation that this is an historical fact. Right. Now, we also have witnesses to Jesus' actual appearances. Uh, he was seen alive after the event, not once, not twice, but I, I've found at least ten times, according to the records. He was seen not by just one person, whose word might be doubted, but by groups of two people, seven people, ten people, eleven, and even five hundred. So there's more than half a thousand people who saw him personally, face to face after his resurrection, uh, under different circumstances. Now, what are these circumstances? They talked with him, they walked with him, they ate, they, he opened the scriptures, he prepared a fire for breakfast on the seashore, he showed the nail scars in his hands, he was, they were allowed to touch his real body, and uh, so they spoke with him, they touched him, they dined with him, and he gave them the order to spread the news to the world. And so right. a, a doctor, such as you are, Dr. Dr. Bill, a doctor named Luke, was that he said these were infallible proofs, and I believe a, an intelligent man who, who knew his profession would not be misled by, uh, by hearsay. He said these are infallible proofs. Wow. Okay. So uh, and there was also the problem that they, they weren't hallucinating because of uh, it wasn't mass hypnotism. Uh, the fact is the disciples did not believe he would rise. They doubted he had risen. Uh, now, if you're not wanting something to happen, you're not hallucinating that it, with a fervent desire that it's going to happen because your, your mindset is that it can't happen. And they didn't believe it would occur in the first place. And yet different groups of people kept seeing him in different places, different times. And uh, it, it's clear that they did not believe the resurrection of Jesus until they simply had to believe it. Okay, yeah. we, we, might, we might argue and say, well, look, uh, it's impossible. We've never seen anyone rise from the dead. Exactly. When we come back, I hear the bumper music. We'll be back in just a moment with more amazing Allison. Welcome back, and um, uh, let's continue. The, uh, the, this particular tetrad is very important because we are, we're at the point now in history where the state of Israel, which is not run by uh, ancient Hebrews, they're run by 17 Satanistic globalists, uh, is an abomination. While the American uh, country is not a republic under God, it's led by a president who is a non-Christian, bisexual, former, uh, maybe current, abuser of cocaine, uh, we have policies that are clearly anti-Christian uh, that are being put in place, including the move to try to make sure that you can have the right to worship but not the right to evangelize, even if you want to make sure your employees have Christian health care. They want to force the uh, employers, say, of Hobby Lobby to uh, pay for abortifacients and, and abortions. Well, we have in Russia, a, uh, after the abominations that have occurred in Russia, caused by Sabbatean Satanists and these Bolsheviks, a leader who professes to be a Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Christian, uh, who basically says he wants to return to biblical Christian values that's ahead of the so-called evil empire of Russia and the former Soviet Union. It's so remarkable these things are happening. But God's doing a work. He's going to do something to bring America and Israel back to repentance. And it's amazing that these prophecies about Russia go back uh, over 500 years to uh, Alexander the Great, the original founder of the current Russian Empire. Um, and what I see happening now, this prophecy about the, the return of Jesus is dependent on several things. The first is there's going to be a time of great tribulation, which is happening right now. Uh, there's going to be a dividing of the city, a setting up of a peace treaty that partitions the state of Israel. 
and the uh, starting of the sacrifice, which last fall they actually got certification to start rebuilding the temple and start the sacrifice. So I think we're not far away. I, I can't get set dates, but I can tell you, if we're watching as a, as a watchman in the tower, looking at all the scriptures and watching the signs like the Mark built the four blood moon tetrads, the first one starting up this Passover, which is three days later the resurrection of Jesus, I think we're we're very, very close. Uh, I don't think we're far away at all. I'm not going to be a much older than I am now before I, th I see the tribulation come and before Yeshua HaMashiach returns to earth. I think we're very yeah. close. I, I agree with you that uh, so many prophecies now are converging for the first time in history. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's, let's get into some more detail uh, uh, about this amazing story that you've written in the Forbidden Secret. Well, Dr. Bill, the importance of this resurrection story, uh, before we continue, is the fact that uh, our, our hope it hinges on, upon the truth or, or, the, or the not of this fact, that Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death and has the keys of death in his hands. And he can do this for anyone who puts their trust in him so that they right. can inhabit the new, the new world that he has planned, where there'll be no more troubles and, and all this mess up that has been made those who make it will be excluded, and only those who are willing to, to, have, uh, to take part in the character renewal program that he is offering will have opportunity, or can be trusted to have opportunity in the new world. Right. It involves so, uh, a character change, a, a change, a resurrection of life while we are alive, apart from the fact that death will be abolished. Right, and it also transcends the political systems. Uh, you know, when Jesus came, he didn't try to change the political system. He tried to change men's hearts. If we have people transformed to become real believers, ready to apprehend the truth and to say the Shema, hear and do God's will, we don't need to talk about political systems. All early Christians never wanted for anything. Everybody brought into common uh, all of their personal possessions, and so nobody ever went without clothes or food or shelter. Uh, you know, we have a current system that's all based on, quote, an economy, where it can make a small part of the population ultra wealthy. So 90% of the increase in wealth in America in the last 10 years went to 450 people. That's not right. Mm -hmm. and, I, no. you know, and we don't even really have capitalism anymore. We have corporatism that's a global fusion of, of fascism of the transnational corporations. This is all satanic. Uh, we haven't really had capitalism to, uh, since the founding of America, where it was around for a very short time before the banks took over. And it's not right. I mean, that's why the, even the debt was forgiven so that by the seventh year, which is the year called the Shemitah year, all debt was forgiven by law. And in fact, when they didn't honor the Sabbath rest year, God brought judgment and actually pulled the Israelites out of the land of, of, of Israel because they would not honor the Sabbath rest year and the forgiveness of debts of all of their people who went into debt and therefore became what we call debt-induced slaves. And it was a different slavery than the modern slavery that we had of the blacks and other people brought to America. It was a slavery where they fell into debt to work off that debt. They had to pay it off by being employed by somebody and becoming, quote, their slave for a period of time. But by the end of the sixth year, in the Shemitah year, they were released into, uh, and they were also given provision. They weren't just sent out with nothing. They were given provision from their, quote, slave owner so that they could start their life again. Uh, we don't have that kind of uh, concern. We don't have a healthcare system that's godly people that are served the Most High God first before God would let them near his children which is all the high priests of, of, uh, of, Co of the Kohens. Uh, you know, my family, my mother's side, was the uh, Kohen Gadol, which is the Naima family, the descendants directly of Moses. And uh, they were received that name from the Naami tribe, which is the uh, tribe in Eshfahan when they were taken away by the Medo Persians. And my ancestor married the daughter of the king of the Medes and took on the tribal name, which is why if you go all over the Middle East, you'll find the name Naima or variations of it like Na Naiman, or Naima, uh, Nima, and they're all basically descendants of the Kohens and the Kurds from Eshfahan. And uh, they returned to the Temple of Jerobabel uh, in the fifth century BC, uh, and the Temple of Herod Agrippa, uh, the uh, you know the apostate Jew who served the Romans as a as a uh, he was a master architect and very intelligent, but he was very evil, and he tried to kill off all the babies because he knew about the prophecy and he knew even about the the uh, the three wise men who knew the star signs and knew that there was a sign that was going to indicate the Messiah was coming. And that Messiah is coming again, and I think evil knows that there's a, there's a time of trouble that's going to come upon the evil of this world. They know that their lease is over. Uh, can you can you get into some of those facts, too? Because I think that the devils are absolutely determined to fast-track 
the cashless biometric system, the wars that they're trying to start. They're desperate to start a war in Ukraine and Crimea, desperate to start a war and attack on Syria, desperate to do a nuclear attack on the Bashir reactor and the nuclear centrifuges in Iran, desperate to start a war with Vladimir Putin. Uh, it, it's obvious that the West and the Sabbatean Satanistic bankers are desperate to start the destruction of mankind. Oh, yes, they want us all dead, for sure. Right. Yeah, and, and you don't even need to posit any advanced theories or even conspiracies. You just have to look at the evidence that's right in front of you. It's like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. And even if you're just greedy, you wouldn't do what they're doing, because they're, what they're doing is foreign policies like Obama and the bankers in Europe and in NATO that, that would just, it's like sticking a stick into a cage with a large, uh, you know, Kodiak black bear, or brown bear, that's, you know, 12, 13 feet tall when it stands up. They can break through its cage and eat you alive with its claws six and a half to eight inches long. And yet people are stupid enough to stick the stick through and find, think it's fine that Obama and NATO does these things with Russia. It just, it doesn't, it defies logic. And, and of course, the Russians are turning strongly back toward being a very religious country after all the horrors they went through. Uh, how would you tie that back to some of the Russian prophecies and what's going on with our current world events? Well, you know, the impossible is happening. Things that by human prediction, uh, we would say, could not happen. God is able to look ahead and, and tell us what we would never believe. And um, he tells us that when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The world yeah. events today are shaping up just as they should have if the Bible is true and if God's yeah. word is to be believed. Right. Yeah. Uh, sh sh shall we complete the, uh, the resurrection yeah, let's that. section? Let's, yeah, let's, con let's continue yeah. that, yeah. Because without the resurrection, it, all the events that are coming now have no hope for anybody. It's only the fact that our Lord has power over death and he has power over our bad habits that we, we can prepare ourselves for the new earth by his spirit dwelling in us. Absolutely. When we return, we're going to hear a lot more specifics from Jonathan Gray again, beforeus.com. Welcome back to the uh, Neutral Medical Report. And uh, Jonathan, please complete some of the ideas because uh, we, we want to get you on before the... Uh, maybe we'll get you on next week again too. I'd love to do that. Because it's important people grasp with this first of the Tetrad and the essential core nature of what the resurrection is. And I tell people that relationship was... And I say your heaven starts today when you become a son or daughter of the Most High and you start to Shema here and do God's will. That's the definition of good. And hell only becomes evident when the body drops away. And I've had some people misinterpret that, saying that it took the fire out of hell. No, no, the fire starts within. The fire of separation from God is an eternal fire that burns you and annihilates you forever. Uh, there's no taking out the fire of hell. Uh, hellishness becomes evident when the body drops away because a lot of people kind of massage their own ego and think that they're wise or they can create peace without God, and that's just not true. So please continue. That's right. Now, uh, I was thinking of a, a man called Saul. He was a Pharisee. He was well educated. Uh, he would not accept uh, the, the witness of the disciples relating to Yeshua. And he gave testimony that uh, he was going to destroy them all. In fact, he was going out outside his own land in, into neighboring countries to do his dirty work. And he was on his way up to Damascus. Uh, while he, he was an ardent unbeliever, and right there on the road, he met the resurrected Yeshua. Now that meeting turned his life around. Here was an ardent unbeliever. He hated the very thought of Yeshua, and he met Yeshua, and his life was changed. Now how can that ever be explained? I mean, no psychiatrist could explain that without reference to the fact that the experience was real. He actually saw Jesus alive again. He was skeptical. He did not believe his resurrection until he simply had to believe it. And I believe the conversion of Saul, who later on became Paul, is one of the great uh, hallmarks of history as far as a, an unbeliever having evidence that would turn his life around because his whole life passion was against Christianity. <clears throat> or against the way, as it was called. Now, I'd just like to um, 
look at uh, what some scientists and and uh, men uh, of renown in the legal profession have had to say about the resurrection of Jesus. I, I think these are very, very interesting. Now, here's a chemical scientist and a historian, Dr. A.C. Ivey. Uh, Dr. Ivey was employed by the Department of Chemical Science in the University of Illinois. And this is what he said regarding the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He said, on the basis of historical evidence of existing biological knowledge, the scientist who is true to the philosophy of science can doubt the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he cannot deny it, because to do so means that he can prove that it did not occur. I can only say that present day biological science cannot resurrect a body that has been dead and entombed for three days. To deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the basis of what biology now knows is to manifest an unscientific attitude according to my philosophy of the true scientific attitude. Now, there's a professor down here in New Zealand at the University of Auckland, Dr. Uh, professor Blakelock, and he said, I'm a classical historian, and as an historian, I look upon the empty tomb and the only available explanation of it as a better authenticated fact than almost anything else I have taught about the first century in all my university years. So there we've got two scientists, uh, experts in their field, admitting the fact that the evidence points to a, uh, a rather than a denial, the evidence cannot do not be denied, uh, but rather it points to an historical fact. Now, let's go to a lawyer, Sir Edward Clark. He said, as a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive, and over and over again in the High Court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Now, there was also an author uh, of, of a Roman history, a three-volume history of Rome, Professor Thomas Arnold, and he was appointed to the chair of modern history at Oxford. And his statement regarding the resurrection of Jesus is this. Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece, as carefully as every judge, summoning up the most important cause. I have myself done it many times over. I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort. Uh, then we have Lord Lindenhurst. I mean, I've got so many in my files here. This man was one of the greatest legal minds in British history. Uh, in his life, he held the highest offices of which a judge in Britain could ever have held. He was Solicitor General of the British Government. He was Attorney General of Great Britain. He was three times High Chancellor of Cambridge University. And his simple statement is this. I know pretty well what evidence is. And I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection has never broken down yet. Uh, there's uh, Simon Greenleaf, professor of law at Harvard. And uh, he says, the laws of every country were against the teachings of Jesus' disciples. Propagating this new faith, even in the most inoffensive and peaceful manner, they could expect nothing but contempt, opposition, reviling, bitter persecutions, stripes, imprisonment, torments, and cruel deaths. They had every possible motive to review carefully the grounds of their faith. If then their testimony was not true, there was no possible motive for its fabrication. Uh, I, I can't help but think that Lord Darling's statement, though, tops it off. He was the Chief Justice of England. He said, on that greatest point, we are not merely asked to have faith. In its favour is, as living faith, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. Now, there you have some of the greatest scientific and legal minds of our day uh, testifying that the evidence for the resurrection is overwhelmingly positive.
positive and irrefutable. I think that's quite important to share. Yeah, that's important. Now, um, the people that know about Jesus and don't understand or believe, and I often get people very confused about the idea of belief. And uh, faith, which is belief, is a gift that God gives you. You deposit love, which is you're seeking God, and you want and you accept God, uh, and then you pray that God will give you the deposit of faith. And then when you have that deposit of faith, it's like having a DHL number saying it's being delivered tomorrow morning at ten o'clock. And we're not the author of faith; God is. And so a lot of time, people think faith is blind, and it's the exact opposite. Faith is actually confirmed in your knowing it's a knowing that is absolute it's almost like you know the checks in the mail the deposit is electronic funds transferred to your spiritual bank account uh you just know it just like your body is going to get healed you know that your your relationships are going to be healed there's a confirmation that passes the understanding of the mortal mind but it's confirmed with logic it's confirmed with with actions and it's confirmed with a knowing so faith is never blind and i want people to know that that they don't need to be uh they're often told this by you know either the name it, claim it crowd, which is incorrect, because you have to come in, in, in line with God's will. And they also uh, believe in blind faith. Well, God, if you really want to, you can, you know, I'd like you to do this. God doesn't do that. Uh, God gives you a confirmation of what he is going to do in his will, and he tells you. You just know. You have a knowing, whether it's in dreams, visions, circumstances, you just have a knowing that's absolute. And that's why I want people to walk by faith. As they, as they move into this tetrad, starting very soon they need to know that that's real <clears throat> so they're very John, true Jonathan, so faith we, is a deposit on something certain absolutely i want to connect to you by skype and we'll get our time worked out for the next visit because i want to try to get you if i can before the big day which is coming up uh, real soon here believe it or not uh it is next monday is uh, the that evening? Of course, it starts at sundown. Starts Passover or Pesha. Amazing. So maybe we can make it uh, Monday or Tuesday morning, which is the still on Passover Tuesday the fifteenth, which would be good. Take care, everybody. Take action tomorrow. Harley Schwanger's back and Bill Salas. Uh, amazing discussions tomorrow. You don't want to miss it.